Welcome to Muslims and Mental Health with Sister Heather, a groundbreaking program looking at mental health issues through the biopsychosocial spiritual paradigm. Welcome to another episode of Muslims and Mental Health. Again, today we are looking at part two in our series on looking at Islam and the Black American, looking toward the third resurrection with Dr. Sherman Jackson. Um, just a little bit about Dr. Jackson again. If you didn't see the first part of our series, Dr. Jackson is a scholar scholar. He is um, the publisher of works such as Islamic Law in the State, the Constitutional Jurisprudence of Shihab al-Din al-Qarafi, um, On the Boundaries of Theological Tolerance in Islam, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali Faisal al-Tafrika, um, Islam and the Black American, Looking Toward the Third Resurrection, which we're discussing today, Islam and the, black, uh, uh, Islam and the Problem of Black Suffering, as well as the initiative to stop the violence, uh, Sadat's Assassins and the Renunciation of Political Violence. So welcome back, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. I want to start, you know, back into our conversation around Islam and the Black American. And I want to ask you, while the book is not exclusively about Black American Muslims, what, if anything, would you say differently today? It's been wow. about 11 years since its publication in 2005. Um, what would you say differently today than you would have said when you wrote the book to the black community and have conditions for um, black American Muslims improved or worsened since the writing of this book? Wow. Another excellent question. Um, I, I think that, I mean, the, the, the book was... Um, in a sense, uh, addressed to uh, at least four audiences. One was uh, black American Muslims. The other was, um, quote unquote, immigrant Muslims. Um, the third was uh, the black American community uh, at large. And, and, and fourthly, um, the broader American community um, at, 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 at large. Um, and one might even say a fifth one, which would be the sort of global Muslim community, because I think that any time a, a Muslim tries to speak uh, in the voice of what is um, Islamically authentic, um, he or she always imagines part of his or audience to be the global uh, community of Muslims. Um, I think that with regard to... Um, the black American community of Muslims um, alongside the black American community. One of the things that I, 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 I probably would have tried to make clearer was that this book was not primarily interested in history in terms of, you know, personalities, places, dates, um, sort of a chronology of this happened, then that happened, and because that happened, then this happened. I wasn't, I wasn't primarily interested in that. I was primarily interested in the following. Um, if you recognize or imagine the fact that something along the lines of 10 times the number of African slaves that came to America, went to Brazil alone. Um, so South America has many, many times the number of African slaves that went there, South and Central America, um, than came here. And yet, um, we don't see Islam in that part of the world in the same way that we see it here in terms of its spread among black Americans. We mm -hmm. don't see um, anybody else producing a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or a Mos Def or a, um, a Muhammad Ali or, or a Malcolm X. Um, um, there's something very black American about this phenomenon of Islam. And in this book, um, I was trying to get at the heart of that mm -hmm. and to understand what that was and what that has contributed to where we are now. And that's where black religion, 
communal conversion uh, came in. Um, and that's where the focus on the immigrant community in terms of how it affected um, black American Muslim authority to self-define as Muslims in an American space. So I think I would have made that point uh, clearer um, because I think that you know many people r read and have read the book um, as a historical chronicle. Um, it's not it's not meant to be that. It is more of um, almost a, a social historical analysis, and I'm 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 even more interested in the intellectual issues that define the way in which Black American and other Muslims think about Islam in an American context. So that's the one thing I want to make clear. I think with regard to the immigrant community, um, um, today I would point out the following. Um, I think that in this post-9-11 world where, I mean, even more, most recently you have people like Donald Trump saying things like, you know, I would not allow Muslims to come to this country. Um, you know, immigrant Muslims are targeted in a very vicious, um, bigoted, um, dare I say, racist way. And I think that uh, because of that, many uh, Muslims in America, who are either immigrants themselves or the children, or, or perhaps now even the grandchildren of immigrants, um, may see in my focus on the category immigrant Islam, um, a similar sentiment of, of exclusion, uh, of targeting, um, in a very negative sense. Um, and I would have wanted to make it clear that, um, you know, Donald Trump is one thing. Um, my analysis has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I accept immigrant Muslims as uh, my brothers and sisters, um, and will defend their uh, their right to carve out a dignified existence for themselves as Muslims in America, as I will uh, any, any anyone else. Having said that much, however, um, there is a historical reality that must be confronted, must be confronted honestly. Um, those who came here from the Muslim world did deploy um, their religious authority in a way that was also uh, often uh, at the expense uh, of black American Muslims. Um, they have changed the face of Islam um, in America um, to the point where now it is far, far, far more likely to be viewed as an alien implant um, than it was, uh, let's say, during the days when um, Imam W.D. Muhammad first took over the nation of Islam. These are realities. Um, and they have come at the expense of the Muslim community in general. Do you think that's something that has only affected African-American Muslims? N not at all. And, and again, I think that, I mean, again, I, I think we have to um, put aside some of our uh, sensibilities and look at this situation um, courageously. Um, Muslims coming from the Muslim world to America um, were coming to the West. Mm -hmm. um, and the West um, was that entity that colonized and dominated them. Of course they would have a certain difficult predisposition toward the West, um, trying to find their, their firm footing. And, and, and here's why the, the title of the book is not Islam and the African American. Um, it's entitled Islam and the Black American because I believe that Black Americans um, are, to a very, very appreciable extent, um, a sort of an American phenomenon. Um, and that's not to negate or even downplay um, the African roots of Black Americans, including myself. Um, I celebrate that fact. Um, but we've been in America almost half a millennium. Um, I don't know of any people who exist in a place for 400 years um, and does not, in some appreciable way, become a new people. We are black Americans. 
to the extent that one has a negative predisposition toward America, one almost has to have a negative predisposition towards black Americans. Because um, as uh, James Baldwin said, um, and he used the terminology of the time then, Negroes don't exist anywhere but America. They are an American product. So my point is that um, the predisposition towards the West as the former colonizer, as the former dominator, um, affected black American Muslims, and it would affect anyone else who happened to be an American. And I think that part of, again, the value of that Islamic tradition is that it affords Muslims the tools with which to negotiate all this stuff um, in a balanced manner. Um, and, I, and I think that that's, a, that, that th that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. And so um, what would you say today to the, the black community? Ah, and also, yeah, yeah. How, do you think the conditions for the black American Muslim have improved or have worsened? Um, to, the, to the black American uh, community at, at large, um, in some ways, I mean, I was very much obsessed with getting Islamic tradition to speak to the issues that I raise effectively. And I think that in some ways, that may have limited the accessibility of the book to black Americans who happen not to be, you know, in any way affiliated with that. Um, and so I wish I, I, wish I could have um, written a book that was more open that might actually promote broader, uh, uh, more uh, diffused conversation between black American Muslims and black American non-Muslims um, uh, in a manner that would perhaps heighten the degree of understanding, not of only black American Muslims and black American non-Muslims, um, but of America as, as a historical entity. Um, so that, that's one thing I wish there. Um, with regard to the improvement of uh, the plight of black American Muslims. Do um, you think it's improved or worsened? On balance, I think I would incline, well, look, let me say this. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. Um, but I think that if we take as, as a standard of judgment the ability to, to self-define, the ability to be at home in one's own skin, um, the ability uh, to have the confidence that one um, can live one's life as a Muslim uh, spontaneously without always having to try to anticipate what the judgments of someone who does not necessarily understand the backdrop out of which one is coming. Um, um, if we look at the degree to which Islam as a whole is indigenized in American society, I would have to say uh, things have worsened rather than, 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 than improved. I think there's a lot of dislocation um, in the black American community. In fact, if we look at uh, things such as how the broader black American community looks at the black American Muslim community, um, the black American Muslim community was held in far higher esteem, I would say 30 years ago, um, in the black American community at large than they are today. Mm -hmm. And part of that has to do with um, the fact that the image of Islam in America at one time was um, almost predominated by a black presence. Now it's predominated by um, sort of an immigrant, uh, if not immigrant slash overseas, um, not presence, but certainly an image, mm -hmm. all right? So when one says Muslim today, um, one thinks about uh, you know, someone who, who has immigrated from this country from someplace else. I think that that has done a lot to do to, a lot to diminish the esteem that um, uh, the Black American Muslim community um, 
now enjoys in the broader black community. And I think, quite frankly, that's something that's very dangerous for both the black American Muslim community and the broader uh, immigrant and white American Muslim community, because I think that um, the black American Muslim community um, is the community that really, for historical reasons, we're not talking about any superiority or inferiority here, but we're talking about for historical reasons, um, they are the community that can really indigenize um, the phenomenon of Islam in America. Um, um, no one in their right mind would ever tell Muhammad Ali, go home. Mm -hmm. um, he is an authentic Muslim American icon. To have that kind of social capital is critical for the health, well-being, and flourishing of any religion. Mm -hmm. And so I think that to the extent that we lose that kind of prestige in the black American community at large, we lose it in America at large, um, and that, that, that can only uh, uh, come at the expense of the, the health and well-being of Muslims. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very interesting because you see pictures of Donald Trump, um, some of these other politicians sitting next to Muhammad Ali or, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, some of these very well-known um, American Muslim icons, as you said. Um, but when it comes to actually talking about American Muslims, they have completely erased that aspect of them. Um, and it's become so commonplace, it's almost like they treat them as an exception as opposed to the rule. And we've talked about on this program before, the, uh, Dr. Amna McLeod talked about the integration of the African-American Muslims within everyday society, mm -hmm. um, that it's become, they become so part of the society that, uh, you know, they basically go unrecognized at this point as being set apart. But there's a danger in that as well. They've also gone unrecognized and made an exception, it seems like. Um, but I, I want to pick up on this conversation. I need to take a short break oh, for a sponsor. Okay. So we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Hi, welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery and my name is Yvette Kuglin and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time, we don't even know what's wrong with us, and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Welcome back to Muslims and Mental Health. Again, we're discussing the book, Islam and the Black American with Dr. Sherman Jackson. And we're gonna continue our conversation. I wanna switch gears just a little bit, uh, but on a similar vein and ask you specifically targeting Black American Muslims and their children. What can be done to stem the tide of apostasy, either socially or theologically, in the black American community? Wow, these are, these are monster questions. Very good, though. Um, I force one to not only think, but to, to focus on what's really important. I, 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 I really um, do think that the the issue of apostasy and whether people um, um, maintain their identity um, as Muslims has a lot more to do with the sociocultural reality of both Muslims or Muslim communities and the broader American community than it does um, with theological issues per se. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Part of the problem that um, we suffer from now um, is that the Islamic religious tradition has been essentially reduced to the strictly religious realm. 
as a result of which Islam has sort of ceased to be a civilization that carries its own culture, its own cultural genius, mm. uh, its ability um, to provide cultural outlets um, uh, for identity formation that carry the values and the virtues of Islam um, uh, through the medium of everyday existence, which is culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that many young Muslims, um, because Islam has ceased to be culturally productive, all right, um, have a difficult time maintaining their ability to identify with Islam in terms of their everyday existence. Mm -hmm. Not in terms of their theology, but in terms of their everyday existence. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was so really... ability to inspire. Well, to inspire, but also um, to be relevant to an everyday existence in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, one of the things that movements such as the Nation of Islam and even Morris Science Temple and other proto-Islamic movements did, um, they were a civilization. Mm -hmm. They were not just theological beliefs, all right? They were a way of dressing, a way of talking, a way of walking, a way of cooking, Mm -hmm. uh, um, a way of relating um, to each other in public space. Mm -hmm. They were gender relations. They were all these cultural kinds of things um, in, in a manner that um, a young person could indulge their religion um, without having to be sort of exclusively in a religious state of mind. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that... Um, Islam in America has to understand the importance of recapturing that ability to be culturally productive mm -hmm. um, in such a way that um, religion becomes something, I mean, especially religion like Islam, um, which, is, which is different from Protestantism. I mean, we, um, and that's not a, a slap at Protestantism. I mean, Protestantism would probably pride itself on that. But Islam is more than just internalized beliefs, mm -hmm. all right? It is, it is a public and a publicly communal presence as well. Um, and I think that without that cultural production, um, young Muslims are, are going to continue to be afflicted um, um, with what W.E.B. Du Bois uh, uh, called double consciousness, where they find themselves in a state where they um, want to be Muslims on the one hand, um, because theologically that's where they are, um, but want not to be Muslims on the other hand, because culturally it's not cool to be a Muslim. Okay. It's not popular to be a Muslim. It's not acceptable to be a Muslim. Um, and that dimension cannot be solved simply by focusing on the theological. Mm -hmm. There has to be cultural production that comes along with Islam mm -hmm. as a civilization and not simply limiting it to the narrow realm of um, theology, ritual, and the like. Mm -hmm. And so how can black American Muslims build institutions that will be relevant to their particular history, culture, and experience as Muslims in America today? In, in some ways, to my mind, I mean, that, that's, that's related to the last question because alongside culture, um, um, th there has to be material production. Mm -hmm. I think, quite frankly, that one of the major keys... What do, what do you mean by material production? I, I, money. Uh -huh. um, um, you know, all, all of the talk about building institutions... Um, that ignores the necessity of, 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 of wealth production to sustain, to establish and sustain those institutions um, will, will basically go nowhere. So I, I think that, again, um, you know, having the right theology, that's important. Having the right uh, perspective on Islamic law, all that's important. But how all these things are going to um, establish themselves in such a manner that they remain Relevant, relevant and efficacious in the everyday lives of Muslims, how Muslims then are going to be able to assume their place in society when they can actually contribute to the shape that society takes. 
This is going to take cultural production. It's going to take institution building. And institution building, all right, within the black American community, the key, I think, lacking element is money. Um, I think that this is an area where um, immigrant Muslims have done an absolutely fantastic job. They have built uh, institutions. Um, um, I mean, there's not a there's not a state in the union now that doesn't have a mosque. There's barely a city, a uh, major city um, in America that doesn't have a mosque mm -hmm. that was built by immigrant Muslims, mm -hmm. Muslim schools, um, um, all kinds of professional associations. Um, but that community is highly educated uh, and that community um, has the uh, financial resources uh, and wherewithal with which to do those things. Um, Part of what has to happen in the black American community is that the understanding of Islam has to be expanded and there have to be practical steps that address the issue of wealth production mm -hmm. um, within the black American community. And it won't happen overnight. I think that, you know, we have to, I think, get used to thinking transgenerationally. Um, but if we put that, that, that piece of the puzzle in place today, all right? within one or two generations, you start generating the kind of surplus income that can actually sustain institutions, all right? Um, cultural institutions, educational institutions, political institutions, professional institutions, um, in ways that can, can, can really bring back the civilizational dimension of Islam in such a way that I think right now we're still struggling with. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what else would you like people to know about Islam and the Black American that we haven't covered? Um, well, I think two things. I think one, um, and and this was a dimension that was addressed to the broad, broader Black community. Um, I, I I think that we still have a very uh, weak. Uh, conversation between black American Muslims and black American non-Muslims in America. There's not much uh, dialogue or, or exchange um, in that between those two communities. Um, and uh, part of that um, has to do with the manner in which um, elements within the black American non-Muslim community um, have reacted against Islam. And I think that um, in the book, I, I refer to this as Black Orientalism, um, and uh, um, I, I, I would like to see those conversations um, both started and deepened, um, because I don't think that that kind of animosity serves either community. Um, I think the other thing that uh, comes out of Islam and the Black American is that, you know, racism, white supremacy, these are fundamental uh, problems um, in America um, and the, uh, the most direct impact is on black American Muslims. But I think that what I think is important to understand is that white supremacy cannot be defeated purely through political means. Um, and let me try and articulate what I mean by that. A few years ago, or maybe about 10 years ago, um, Professor Cornell West came to the University of Michigan and he gave a, uh, a public address. Uh, and he spoke about an experience he had uh, with a young white lady at, at Harvard. Um, she came up to him and she said to him, um, Mr. West, you're just a... Um, uh, Professor West, you're just a, you're just such, you, you're so brilliant. You're such a brilliant thinker. I'm, I'm, I'm just in awe of you. Um, but I have to say, I'm a little bit sort of um, perplexed and disappointed by the fact that you keep talking about all this white supremacy stuff. Um, we're in the 19, I don't remember what it was, but the late 20th century, and you know, the days of white supremacy are gone. So I don't understand why someone as brilliant as you, continues to harp on this stuff. And Cornell West said to her, um, he says, well, um, thank you very much for your, your kind words, but if I still have a little bit of white supremacy in me, I suspect 
that you probably have some in yourself as well. And the point that I'm trying to make is that there is a necessity of addressing that inner self of us all that um, is needed if white supremacy is to be defeated. Mm -hmm. Even if we shut down the institutions that carry white supremacy, if the heart, the soul is colonized by it, then we will continue to conduct ourselves in a way that's representative of it. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that's a long way of saying there's a spiritual dimension um, um, that is needed to be brought to bear on the issues that confront black American Muslims and black Americans in general. Mm -hmm. And the last chapter of Islam and the Black American deals with the necessity of addressing the inner self. And that that is not something, uh, it's, that's an indispensable part of any struggle to produce a better world. Mm -hmm. um, because no supremacy, um, white supremacy, male supremacy, Arab supremacy, no supremacy um, can function effectively unless the victims of that supremacy internalize it. Mm -hmm. um, and even when you get rid of all the institutions, all right, um, without addressing that inner self, mm -hmm. to rid that inner self um, of that malady, it will continue and probably morph into, into something else. Mm -hmm. So um, Islam is not simply about, you know, the public domain. It is about that. But it is also very much about um, the private realm of, of spirituality, of, of, of refinement of the self, of psychological well-being. All of these things have to be included in terms of what Islam actually is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like, you know, from the beginning of, of what you're talking about there, um, there's a lot of work to do around creating empathy for uh, both indigenous Muslims and the immigrant Muslims. And there are stories and narratives there where empathy can be created because whereas, you know, you have the issue of privilege and, and dealing with that um, with the indigenous Muslims, you also have the story of living between two worlds with the immigrant Muslims and all that means to them and what that has, you know, the sort of... Um, traumatic aspects that have aff afflicted them, um, which may have, you know, uh, shown itself as uh, looking like as bending more towards supremacy mm -hmm. or supremacist um, actions. And so it, it would be great, as you said, to, to deepen that conversation, to be able to create spaces where empathy can be created on both sides and understanding. Um, which will go a long way in terms of the mental health mm -hmm. of our community. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is a good conversation to have. I know that you're resistant to these types of uh, forms, but Can I, I really appreciate... Can I just say one thing before we move to that? Because you, you, you raised a really, really important issue there mm -hmm. about, about the mental health of, of, of both communities. I think that, um, and I'm not a mental health professional, I'm just speaking here on a fundamental human level, I think that one of the most damaging aspects to anybody's mental health is to have an existence where they just feel completely misunderstood. Mm -hmm. They're just not understood. And no matter how much they try and articulate themselves, they're just not understood. Mm -hmm. And I think on both sides of this conversation, we have a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Immigrant Muslims, these, these black American Muslims, they just don't understand black American Muslims, uh, and they don't understand because they're nativist. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, reverse, they're, they're involved in reverse racism themselves. Black American Muslims are saying, these immigrants just don't understand. And probably there's an element of truth on both sides of that, 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 that charge. Well, both of them have narratives of survival. Well, not only that, but I think both of them, and, and when you're in a narrative of survival, I would imagine you don't have a whole lot of psychological space for understanding right. anything that doesn't relate to your own survival. Mm -hmm. um, but here, one of the things that I, I, I would want to insist upon, and I hope that um, I'm among those who actually practice what I'm about to preach here, inevitable feelings notwithstanding, I think the key moving forward um, is a concept uh, in Islam called adab. Mm -hmm. 
the key is how we have these adab or civility etiquette. Mm -hmm. How do we have these difficult conversations in a manner that's civil? Mm -hmm. How can I confront you, tell you that I think that you're you're wrong or that you've committed this that was injurious or or whatever um, without assassinating your sense of dignity, your person, um, without making you feel that you cannot concede my point without running the risk of having me in turn dominate you to a point mm -hmm. where um, you're better off just telling me to go and fly a kite. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really, really important that we observe etiquette in the manner in which we we exchange. I don't want to put you in a position where I attack you so viciously, mm -hmm. or the presumptions that are come along that come along with my critique make you feel that, well, he's right, but I, I can't I can't acknowledge this because it's just going to um, it's just going to put me in too bad a, 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 a predicament. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we want to be able to uh, improve our ability to communicate and improve our our, our, our shared lot, and that means that we have to be comfortable and safe right. enough. Right, we have to create an environment of safety yeah. for vulnerability yes. to take place. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think that's, I think that's very important. And I think you're right in that, you know, um, empathy is a part of civility. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I think that, th that that's just a key, key, key element. Um, even the Quran tells the Prophet Muhammad, had you been harsh and hard-hearted, the people would have just abandoned you, although you were speaking the truth. Mm -hmm. The manner in which you speak it is also important. Yeah, emotional intelligence is all throughout yes. the Quran. So on that note, though, um, I know that now you're the fun part, right? Okay. Uh, I know, well, I know you're resistant to this forum of taping. Um, and... Uh, but I hope I have enough ability to persuade you to come back and talk about Islam and the problem of black suffering um, on a later date. Well, your 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 listenership right now, uh, well, most of your listenership is probably not aware of the fact that you have an inside track, and there's no such thing as my saying I won't come back. Um, so um, yes, I guess I'll have to. So we will transition now to the fun questions. Okay. And uh, I want to ask you uh, this time, what is your favorite book and why? I don't have a favorite book. Um, um, well, one of my favorite books about Islam in English, uh, one that I recommend to um, people who are interested um, in both Islam as religion, but in something that I think that most Americans just want a sense of, how do these people think? How do, how do Muslims think? How do they agonize their way through you know, the challenges of the modern world? Um, do they just throw Quranic verses at everything? Um, or is there, 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 there a process that's, that's much broader than that? Um, there's a book by a, for, uh, a, 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 a Yugoslavian Muslim uh, by the name of uh, uh, Alija Zetbgovic. It's called Islam Between East and West. Is that still in print? Yes, it is. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite uh, books in English uh, on Islam. I, I still go back today mm -hmm. um, and sort of uh, not entertain, but, but, but um, I don't know, entertain, console, um, enrich myself, enjoy myself um, with, 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 with parts of that book. It's just mm -hmm. a very, very rich uh, rich book. I, I think that it's something that um, um, will, will make you think, um, um, make you feel, um, and actually put you in a position where you feel that you can have a really meaningful uh, exchange uh, with Islam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that book. Um, and what is uh, your favorite genre and why? Do you have genre one? of books? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm an academic, so <laughs> I mean, I I mean, I'm I'm more into academic books. Um, in in some ways, um, I'm not sure how personal I should be on your show, but in some ways, I think that 
Um, I started college very late, so I've always felt in some ways that um, I'm, I'm behind. So I, I never felt that I had the luxury to read a whole lot of uh, uh, fiction books. Um, I read poetry. Um, um, I read um, I read Arabic literature far less now than I than I used to. Um, but uh, for entertainment, um, to pass the time to 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 enrich the spirit. Um, um, yeah, I, I like I like poetry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I like Arabic poetry most of all because Arabic poetry rhymes. English mm-hmm. poetry tends not or often not to rhyme. Um, and would you have a favorite author? Um, no. Um, <laughs> again, I mean, in some ways, it depends on what 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 mood um, uh, one is in. Um, probably two authors that stand out. Um, most um, in English, um, I like uh, I like a Mary Baraka, um, and in Arabic, if we're talking about moderns, um, this is going to be unpopular, but I actually like Adunis, um, and among the classical poets. Um, Probably between Al Mutanabi and Abu Nawaz. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you again very much for coming and discussing your book. If you are not familiar with this book, the book is Islam and the Black American. You can find it on Amazon.com. You can also contact Dr. Sherman Jackson at, doc, uh, at agent Dr. Sherman Jackson at gmail.com or at the University of Southern California. You can contact us with your comments, feedback, and concern at nefshealertherapy at gmail.com, and that's N-A-F-S-H-E-A-L-E-R, therapy at gmail.com. And please join us again. Thank you.